right? It's time to talk about polar coordinates. So let's have a quick refresher on what that means. So when you are in two dimensions, you need two pieces of information to indicate any point. So let's say you were here down at the South Pole. And you look out and you see there's a big shape-shifting alien charging down at you. And so you say, hey, everyone, look out. There's an alien. It's coming from the north. Actually, that doesn't really help. Because you're at the South Pole, every direction is north. So instead, what you would say is, hey, it's coming from an angle. We'll pick an angle to be zero. Pick one direction to be zero degrees. We'll say this angle is pi thirds, or 60 degrees. So now you know what direction. Then all you need to know is, well, how far out do I go? Maybe it's one kilometer. And so if you think about it, on a plane, it goes out infinitely in every direction. So with two pieces of information, what direction do we want me to look, and how far out do you want to go? That can mark any point. And so, since it makes most sense to talk about at a pole, we call it polar coordinates. Now, that is opposed to rectangular, which is the xy that we've been using so far. And those, also, you'll notice, there's an x and a y, there's two pieces of information, because it's two-dimensional. So, polar means we're going to have two things. We have an r and a theta and it is the standard trigonometric setup where pointing out due east is zero degrees and go counterclockwise to determine the angle so this would be something like 120 or something and every point would have unique r and theta needs to be between 0 and 2 pi. So I don't want to say, well, it could be this, say 120 degrees, or we could loop around a second time and get to 480 degrees because you add a 360. We won't do that. We'll just always use the one that's between 0 and 2 pi. Or sometimes they use a negative pi to positive pi, but we're going to do 0 to 2 pi in this class. As for r, well r, we're going to say is always greater than or equal to 0. So you could imagine saying what would a negative r be, and maybe sometimes we will allow that, but most of the time if we don't say otherwise, r is expected to be positive. So if you're trying to pick a point, you want to get an angle between 0 and 2 pi and a positive r. The one exception here is at the origin where r is 0. You can't really say there's a direction for 0. It's every direction, really. So in that case, the theta would be undefined. All right. So that's the basics. Now, we want to define what a polar rectangle is. Now, the other day I was talking about integrals, and I said, when you're doing integrals, if the bounds are constant, then that is called, that will give you a rectangle. But a polar coordinates, it will give you a different shape. If the r goes from a to b and the theta goes from c to d. What it gets is sort of a wedge shape. So let's do this example here. Square root of 4 minus x squared is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to square root of 9 minus x squared. Well, that means we have... Let's see. On one side, we have y equals square root of 4 minus x squared. So y squared is... 4 plus minus x squared or x squared plus y squared equals 4. So that's a circle. Or rather it will just be a semicircle because you notice here there's no plus or minus so we only use the plus. So we will have this semicircle 
And this is the same as r, r squared is 4, so this is the same as r equals 2. And then for the other one, let me erase that bubble, that looks like a 0, I don't want to confuse you. For the other one we had y is square root of 9 minus x squared, so doing the same thing, we have x squared plus y squared is 9, so that would give us a radius of 3. r equals 3. And so what we've defined here when we have this expression that y is between these two is that we are in fact having this little wedge shape. And so how would you describe this in polar coordinates? Well I would say the radius is between 2 and 3. What about the angle? Well, if we point to due east at zero, we can go all the way across the top half of the plane. So that gives the largest angle is pi. So this is how you would express this, this rectangular or uh, wedge shape, I guess. Maybe we'd call it a horseshoe in polar form. So that's basically why we do this is because those wedge shapes are easier to think about in polar. If you were given, say, radius is between 1 and 3, and theta was between pi halves and 3 pi halves, well, you'd say, well, pi halves is straight up, and 3 pi halves is straight down. So it would be all this. So anytime you have a little wedge like this, that's a polar rectangle. And if you are given a problem where it's asked to integrate over some little wedge like this, you should be thinking, can I do this in polar terms? So if I want to put this in a picture here, a regular rectangle means x, y have constant endpoints or bounds. And a polar rectangle means r theta have constant bounds. And if it's neither of those, then the bounds are going to have variables in them. All right, so let's talk about how to do the conversion then. Because what will happen most often is you will see a problem that's given in rectangular, and you'll want to change it into polar. Now, we know a conversion here. X equals R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta. This you should have this memorized by now. If you don't, commit it to memory right now. So, let's say we have a double integral that's x squared plus y cubed dx dy, and we want to change it to polar for some reason. Maybe the region just is easier to work with in polar. So we could plug in r cosine theta for x, get r squared cosine squared. And plug in r sine theta for y, we get r cubed sine cubed. But... There's a little dx dy. And we don't like that. It's like when you do u sub. You change the variables to u. You also change the dx to du. Well, now we got to change the dx dy combo into dr d theta. And so we'll have to come up with a way of doing that. So, let's see how this would work. If we have an integral, double integral over a region r... Okay, the answer is at the bottom, but let's say, let's not jump to the conclusion. Of some function of r and theta, dA. Because dx dy is the same as dA. So we need to change it to dA and then change it to dr d theta. Well, dA represents the area of one of these very small wedges. And so we'd like to write the area of a wedge in terms of r and theta. So let's draw some pictures here. All right, so
got a wedge and we are considering if we've got some big shape we're trying to that we will cut this up into lots and lots of little wedges like this these are like that and like this so each one of these little wedge shapes will look something like this when we zoom in so we want to know what is da well we can divide it up the same way we did with rectangles we have this is r1 r2 r3 dot 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 and this could be like theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 dot 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 so forth so we can say this is let's expand this out to go all the way down to the radius so this is theta j and this is theta j plus 1 this will be r i and this will be r i plus 1 well the area of this wedge that we're interested in is going to be the area of this whole big pizza slice minus this smaller pizza slice okay well what's the area of a pizza slice well if we have a circle and we take a slice out of it pretend that's a circle and this is right at the center let's do that a little better that's a little better here's theta you know the area of the whole pizza is pi r squared well what fraction of it do they have the fraction is theta over 2 pi so the area of the slice is pi r squared times theta over 2 pi. Well, the pi's will divide out, and so we'll get theta r squared over 2. So that's the area of a slice. Now if we just want the area of the crust here, Now the area of a wedge, uh, let me write this in red since it's colored in red up there, would equal the big area of the entire slice minus the area of the smaller slice. So that becomes... Uh, one half r i plus one squared times theta. Uh, how big is the angle? Well, we'll call this delta theta because the difference between delta j one and delta j, if they're all divided up evenly, then all the deltas will be the same. Delta j. And I guess we could do delta R, but I'm going to keep that one separated for a reason. Actually, I'm not sure we could do that anyway. Delta, delta J, delta theta, excuse me. That doesn't make sense. Delta theta. Minus one half RI squared delta theta. Okay, so think about why this works. It's the big wedge, or the big slice minus the small slice ri plus one versus ri let's see if we can factor this a little uh, i don't know what the two's there for so we'll get rid of it so let's factor out one half delta theta and then we have ri plus one squared minus ri squared well that's a difference of squares for me so we can put ri plus one minus ri and ri plus one plus ri so this becomes one half delta theta this ri minus ri plus one minus ri by definition that's delta r what about ri plus one plus ri well let me let's see what can we do with this um 
Well, let's just leave it like this for a minute. Ri plus 1 plus Ri over 2. Okay, this looks really bad. Let me rewrite that. Ri plus 1 plus Ri over 2. Well, this is actually the average of the R's, isn't it? So if you remember, if we were doing like a Riemann sum, we would pick a point somewhere in between here. If we pick the midpoint, its radius would be exactly the average. So we'll call that one Ri star to be the average there. So we can rewrite this as Um, one half or oh I double counted the one half I make mistakes here I don't like it I double count that one half it should have been distributed right there so let's see now this is the average so we'll just say it's okay so it's R I star delta theta delta r now take the limit as i goes to infinity so we get infinitely more wedges well r i star is just a point along there somewhere and as we you know as i goes to infinity those endpoints here, the r i and r plus plus one, kind of smash together to a single point in the middle that would just be called r. So we're getting to a continuum, so it doesn't matter which point we pick. So this would turn into r, and then the deltas become d's, d theta dr. So that's what we wanted. d a can be written as r d theta dr, or dr d theta uh, excuse me excuse me so there's the formula so if all the derivation you didn't quite follow that's okay this is the formula you actually need to have memorized so when you're changing to polar what that means is that an extra r just appears another way of thinking of this is in terms of units these are area units so it would be like i don't know centimeters squared then this dr is centimeters, but d theta doesn't have any units. Radians don't count as real units. So you have an extra r here that is another centimeter. That way you have centimeter squared on the right and also on the left. All right, so that's enough theory. Let's go ahead and do a few examples. So find the double integral of 3x plus 4y squared dA, where r is the region in the upper half plane bounded by x squared plus y squared equals 1, and x squared plus y squared equals 4. Okay. So, it's always best to draw the regions, because you could use the conversion formulas, the x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, but honestly, that's harder than just drawing it and using your eyes. First one, x squared plus y squared is 1, that's r equals 1. x squared plus y squared equals 4, that's the same as r equals 4. We said upper half plane, so it'll be this. So, again, instead of trying to plug in, let's just look at it and say, what is the region? Well, r, this is r equals 1, and this is r equals 2, so r goes from 1 to 2. What about theta? Well, it goes from due east to due west, so theta goes from zero to pi. So we can go ahead and convert. We have 3x, and this thing is capital R here, 3x plus 4y squared dA cross R is, so it'll be double integral r will go from 1 to 2, theta will go from 0 to pi, and so we'll have 3r cosine theta plus 4r squared sine squared theta r dr d theta. 
So there's that extra R that we talked about. All right, so let's see how this works out. Well, then we go, once you've made this conversion, it's really not that different from what we did in rectangular. The only real difference is a lot more trigonometry shows up because we have these uh, thetas everywhere. Okay. If you want to try to race me on this, it might be good practice. 0 to pi, r is 1 to r is 2 of 3 r, I guess it would just be r cubed cosine theta plus r fourth sine squared theta d theta. Which is 0 to pi of, let's bracket this, plug in 2, 8 cosine theta plus 16 sine squared theta minus cosine theta plus sine squared theta d theta. Which is 0 to pi of 7 cosine of theta plus 15 sine squared theta d theta. Now there are some formulas that you need to know. The power reducing formulas. I'm going to go ahead and Google these just so I can show them to you. Power reducing formulas. Trigonometry. It's a trick. Should be good. So let's see if we can get a nice little picture of it. These. Cosine squared is 1 minus cosine of 2x over 2. Or you can pull out a 1 half. And cosine squared is 1 plus cosine 2x over 2. Tangent squared you don't need as much because you can just do sine over cosine. But those first two, you need to commit those to memory because they're going to show up a lot. There are ways you can derive it using the sine squared plus cosine squared is 1 and the formula for cosine of 2 theta. But it's better just to have them in your head. Notice they both involve cosine, yet one of them is a plus and one of them is a minus. All right, so whew. so let's go ahead and continue with this one. We get 0 to pi of 7 sine theta plus integral of, let's use the power reducing formula, 15 over 2. 1 minus cosine of 2 theta d theta. I guess I got a little ahead of myself and I did one part before I was ready to do the other one, but that's okay. This becomes 7 sine pi minus 7 sine 0, which in fact will just go away completely. Those are both 0. Plus, from 0 to pi of 15 over 2, theta minus one-half sine of two theta. Um, yeah. Yep, I got notes here. Got to check every now and then just to make sure I haven't lost my track. So this becomes 15 halves, and I get pi minus one half sine of two pi minus zero minus one half sine of zero. Zero, zero, sine two pi is also zero. So the answer is just 15 pi over two. This is probably a lot easier than if we tried doing rectangular because if we'd done a rectangular, we would have had to do Y, well, first off, there's neither type 1 nor type 2 in this case. Some places we'd start at Y equals 0 and go up to a curve. In other places we go from one curve to the other, or left to right from one curve to the other, and then it switch, and, and plus you'd have all these square roots involved, so it would be much harder to do this in rectangular coordinates. All right, let's do another example. Oh, let me make sure it sounds on, yeah. 
Next, we're going to find the volume of the solid bounded by this plane, z equals 0, and the paraboloid, z equals 1, minus x squared, minus y squared. So what's that look like? Well, we have our basic plane here. So 1 minus, z, 1 minus x squared minus y squared, z equals, looks something like this. So we want to find the volume under this, bounded by the plane z equals 0, the xy plane. So we need to figure out what shape this is. The way we do this, then, we will project onto the xy plane. Because this base here is where z equals 0. So if we just go down to it, z equals 0, we get... 0 equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared, or x squared plus y squared equals 1. Useful identity here is that x squared plus y squared equals r squared, because you put in r cosines and r sine here and square them, then the cosine squared plus sine squared goes away. So we can say this is the same as r squared equals 1, or really just r equals 1, because Square root of 1 is 1, and R has to be positive, so we don't need the plus or minus. So we are integrating the footprint, the xy region is a circle, whose radius is 1. So this is our region R. Now that means little r is not just 1, because if little r were just 1, it would just be the boundary. It's between 1 and 0. What about theta? Well, since it's the full circle, theta needs to go from 0 to 2 pi. So that's a full circle when theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. I know it says equal, and earlier we said it has to be less than. It doesn't really matter with integrals. You can cut off an edge and nothing really changes. So anyway... Our integral then is 1 minus x squared minus y squared dA over region R, which would then become a double integral of 1 minus x squared plus y squared dA. You don't need to write this part if you can do it in your head, but this becomes double integral of 1 minus R squared. And then the dA becomes r dr d theta. Theta r from 0 to 1, theta from 0 to 2 pi. And what this happens a lot when we have these 0 to 2 pi is it just ends up multiplying the whole thing by 2 pi. And that's what's going to happen in this case. We can, since this is factored, we can split it into 0 to 2 pi d theta and 0 to 1 of distribute that r, r minus r cubed dr, <coughs> which becomes just 2 theta here, then 0 to 1 of r squared over 2 minus r fourth over 4, which is 2, that should not, excuse me, typo, that should say 2 pi, not 2 theta. 2 pi 1 half minus 1 fourth and then you do the zero but those will just disappear so it becomes 2 pi times 1 over 4 is pi over 2 that's the answer and compare that to the alternative method if we done this directly 1 minus x squared minus y squared we have to go dy dx, and since it's a circle, we have to say y goes from square root of 1 minus x squared up to <clears throat> 1 minus um, negative and positive, and then y would go from 0 or negative 1 to 1. Or x would go from negative 1 to 1, I mean. And you could do that, but this would require doing some trig sub, I think. 
you do the first integral, you end up with like a three half power. And so polar is a much better way to do it. All right. Let's look at another example here. So find the area enclosed by one component of the polar function R equals cosine two theta. All right, that, what is R equals cosine two theta? That's a weird thing. You might not have seen it before. So let's, how would we go about graphing this? Well, when in doubt, let's make a table. R is cosine of two theta. So I'm going to make a table of theta and R. So if theta is zero, then R is cosine of zero or one. If theta is, let's say, pi over 12, then R would be cosine of pi over six, which is root three over two. Pi over eight would give us cosine of pi over four. I'm just picking numbers here for a theta that I think will work out well. Pi over six would give me cosine of pi over three or one half. And pi fourths would be cosine of pi halves, which is zero. So let's think about how we would graph this then. For the first we say, okay, theta is zero. That means due east radius is one. So we'll go out here to, this is the same as point one, zero, x is one, y is zero. We said angle pi 12, which is just a little over, it's like 15 degrees will give me an, of root three over two. And we go to pi over eight, which is a little higher, you got to root two over two, which is like 0.7. Pi over six, or 30 degrees, goes out to a distance of one half. And pi over four, which is the 45 degree angle here, does not go out at all. So what this means is we will go this way as we go, once we get to pi over 4, we'll come all the way back. In fact, there will be an asymptote here at theta equals pi over 4. And so if I drew this properly, it would stay underneath that. It would come back like this. And what about for negative angles? Well, this is an even function, so we could put a plus or minus on all of these. What would a negative angle mean? Well, it would mean that we would go downward. So this would be symmetric. It would be like this, with an asymptote here at theta is negative pi fourths. Now, I guess they, they intersect here at 0, 0. So the asymptote, they actually do cross it, but only right... It's not really an asymptote, I guess, but it's the line that they get close to and touch at the origin. And so that's one petal of this. And we can even... We can get a graph of this thing. If we look at... Let's go to our calc plot. Uh, let's switch to 2D mode. And we can go to here where we have a function we can say add a function r equals f of theta z so r equals cosine of 2 theta looks like this so you see this was one we call this the petals of a flower um, I think it's also sometimes called a cardioid because it looks like a heart or maybe that's a different thing no, they're related when we get these r functions we tend to get these nice little looping, repeating patterns here. So the question is, what is the area of one of these petals? One component. Well, the boundary of it is defined by R equals cosine of 2 theta. 
Now, the area, we said this in the definition, that the area of a region is the same as the integral of the one function over that region. So if we name this thing capital D, then I want the area of D is the same as the double integral of the one function dA over capital D. So what am I doing? Well, at every point, if we pick a theta, we go out from zero all the way to this curve. But we know this curve is r equals cosine two theta. So what this really does is we say we'll do a double integral. dA will become r dr d theta. r will start at zero, radius of zero, and it will go out until r equals cosine of two theta. Uh, I put too many thetas there. Let me erase that. So this is tricky, but think about what we're saying here. We're saying that if you pick any theta, you fix it, because theta is second, so we treat it as a constant. You fix a theta, and then r will go out to cosine 2 theta. At each one of these thetas, you go from 0 out to cosine of 2 theta. Then, what does theta do? Well, look at our asymptotes, or whatever you call them. They go from negative pi over 4s to positive pi over 4s. So, negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. So, this is something we can integrate. So, we get integral from negative pi over 4 to pi over 4 of r is 0 to r is cosine 2 theta of r squared over 2 d theta which becomes negative pi fourths to pi fourths of plug in cosine 2 theta here I'll pull the one half out we get cosine squared of 2 theta d theta now we need to use another power reducing formula. So that said, we said it becomes one half integral from negative pi fourths to pi fourths, because you can't really integrate this directly. So one half, one plus, now before it was went from theta to two theta. So instead it'll go from two theta to four theta. So cosine four theta d theta, which is one half integral from negative pi four or evaluate from negative pi fourths to pi fourths of one half theta plus one fourth sine of four theta. Uh, that's an equals there on the right. So it becomes one fourth and then bracket pi fourths plus one-fourth sine of pi minus negative pi fourths plus one-fourth sine of negative pi. Okay, well the sine pi is gone, the sine of negative pi is also gone. So we are left with one-fourth times pi over 2 is pi over 8. All right, so that's the answer. All right, so one last problem I want to look at. So, find the volume of the solid lies under the paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared above the xy plane and inside the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 2x. So I want to, let's get a quick graph of this. If I put in 3D and hit these two things, you get a cylinder and a paraboloid. And what we're saying is if we look from the bottom through this little like cardboard paper tube, <coughs> we can see it will start off at the or the xy plane that was in the problem it said above the xy plane so we'd start with z equals zero 
we go up until we hit the underside of that paraboloid. Now we can see it's enclosed, we want to find the area. And so first then we need an equation of this circle. We need to figure out what that circle is and write it in terms of r and theta. All right, if you were to <coughs> project this downward, what would it be? Well, okay, maybe we don't need to project. Well, we can see it's just that circle. So the cylinder that we are given is x squared plus y squared equals 2x. When you see these, you usually want to complete the square on them. So move the 2x over. We get x squared minus 2x plus y squared equals 0. So we'll add 1 here, add 1 here, and I get x minus 1 squared plus y minus 0 squared equals 1. So what this is, this is a circle centered at 1, 0 with radius 1. That's the region in the xy plane that we are dealing with. Now if we were to try to graph this by hand, instead of using technology, we would have the paraboloid looks like this, and the cone or the, not the cone, but the cylinder looks like this. And so it'd be this region under here. And we can see there's that circle. So we need to parameterize this region R. And it's off center. So there's a trick we are going to do. Hold on, let me make sure I got this right. What was the, I think I want to say, <clears throat> x minus 1 squared plus y minus 0 squared is 1. Is this? Let's take a look real quick, make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, so there's a couple ways to do this, but I think what I want to do is I want to go back to this. I want to say when we started off, we had x squared plus y squared equals 2x. Let's go ahead and replace these. We will get x squared plus y squared, same as r squared and 2x same as 2r cosine of theta. We can divide out r from both of these. I guess r could be zero, but that's just one spot. So we get r is 2 cosine of theta. So this circle, instead of having x squared plus y squared is 2x, we can say it's r, cos r equals 2 cosine theta. And so just like before, at every point we have an angle theta, and it goes from zero out to 2 cosine theta. So the setup we get then was, see, what was it we were integrating? What was the function in question? Oh, it was just a volume. So we'll integrate between 0 and x squared plus y squared. So z equals x squared plus y squared is our roof, and this determines our floor. So We are going to do the double integral across the region R of x squared plus y squared dA, which becomes the double integral of R cubed dr d theta. Because when we change the dA, we need an extra R to come in. R will go from 0 to 2 cosine of theta, and theta will go from negative pi halves to pi halves. Why those? Well, because if you look at our graph, we are on the right side of the unit circle, or of the, sorry, of the plane. So like straight down is kind of there, and every little angle you make, even slightly to the right, will hit the circle somewhere. But none of those left angles will. 
So straight down is negative pi halves, straight up is pi halves. <clears throat> and now it's just a lot of grinding. So we'll get negative pi halves to pi halves of r is zero to r is two cos theta, r fourth over four d theta, which becomes uh, negative pi halves to pi halves of 16 cosine to the fourth theta over four d theta, which is, let's pull out a four negative pi halves to pi halves cosine to the fourth theta d theta. One plus cosine squared of two theta. squared. Erase. Erase this. Ugh, I'm messing up somewhere. Okay, this is four negative pi halves to pi halves of cosine squared theta squared d theta. Well, that will become four negative pi halves to pi halves of one plus cosine of two theta squared d theta. <clears throat> so now we can multiply this out, would become four negative pi halves to pi halves of one plus cosine squared two theta plus two cosine of two theta, d theta. And so then this becomes four negative pi halves to pi halves of one plus one half, one plus cosine two theta, plus two cosine of uh, this should be a 4 theta, shouldn't it? Because we are bring, getting rid of the power, so we double the angle. 2 theta. Everything good? 4 times 1 plus... Theta times one half. Yeah, yeah, we're good here. So this will become... F pi half to pi halves of... 4 plus 2 plus 2 cosine of 4 theta plus 8 cosine 2 theta d theta. And I will let you finish from here. The final answer I get is 3 pi over 2. And I hope all that's right. If I made a mistake, let me know on Monday. But the answer, I'm pretty sure, is right. So, yeah, take a look over it. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Until then, I will see you Monday.